And with that, I think we are ready to get started. So good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Experimental Publishing at the Intersection of Science, Art, and Technology, which is sponsored by the MIT Press. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity uh, for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a chat panel. If you don't, please click the button labeled Chat in the upper right corner of the screen to activate the panel. The chat panel will allow you to submit questions to our speakers and to ask for assistance. At the end of the presentation, Roger, John, Cassini, and Jill will take a few minutes to respond to your questions, so please do send them in throughout. If you experience any technical issues, please message me directly using the chat panel, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars during the, the event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording the program, and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with instructions to access the archived version. All right, our presenters today are Roger Molina, Jill Rogers, Cassini Nazir, and John Ippolito. Roger Molina is Distinguished Professor of Art and Technology and Professor of Physics at the University of Texas, Dallas, and he runs the ArtSci Lab. Jill Rogers is the Subscription and Institutional Marketing Manager at the MIT Press, where she has worked for over a decade. She concentrates on the creative marketing of journals and other subscription-based products like scholar likes scholarly communication and impact measures, and enjoys traveling about to meet her serials colleagues and librarian peers across the nation. John Ippolito is a, a, a professor of new media and co-director of the Stillwater Lab and Digital Curation Program at the University of Maine. And Cassini Nazir is a clinical associate professor in the School of Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communication Program at the University of Texas at Dallas, where he teaches classes in interaction and design. He is also Director of Design and Research for the ArtSci Lab. And now we are ready to get started. So over to you, Roger. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good day, um, everybody. Um, so uh, we're going to present uh, this project in, uh, in a, as an opera in five acts or four acts. Uh, you're the last act, uh, the listeners, uh, because we're very keen to involve you in looking at what we're doing. Um, and helping us evolve uh, this, this project over the coming years and, and decades. So I'm just going to start with the Leonardo story uh, with the ed as an editor's perspective. Um, and uh, 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 Mark, you've got, you've got to rotate that slide. <laughs> um, and so um, j just uh, for information, the, the, the Leonardo publications that I'm going to be describing have been now published for 50 years. Uh, and the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology in San Francisco is the nonprofit uh, whose publications, uh, the Leonardo publications, are produced uh, at MIT Press. Um, so, um, um, Mark, the slide's still sideways. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, let, let me just give you some very high level rationales and motivations of why we think this is a good time uh, to de develop this kind of a project which is a mixture of established publishing practices and what we like to call uh, experimental publishing. So the, the community of research uh, and the commercial sectors that this, uh, these publications address is very rapidly growing, uh, especially over the last 10 years. Um, and in this country, uh, that excitement or that interest is captured by this STEM to STEAM moniker of integrating the arts design and humanities into STEM education, research, and industry. Um, the, the current wave of focus uh, of this professional community uh, was triggered or came into focus through a number of uh, convenings organized by the National Science Foundation, the Endowment for the Arts, and the Endowment for the Humanities. 
And in that process, uh, John Maida, who was then the president of the Rhode Island School of Design and the Rhode Island Congressional Delegation, um, advocated uh, the STEM to STEAM uh, movement. And there is now, in fact, a, a STEAM caucus in the U.S. Congress. Um, currently, the U.S. National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine are working on a, a national study, which will be released in the fall of 2018. And of note, uh, the European Union uh, this year, uh, in their Horizon 2020 funding program, uh, launched their uh, STUD program for funding science, technology, and the arts, uh, which addresses both the work of researchers and the creative community, but also the startup uh, community. Um, so, um, you know, some of the kind of uh, rationales and, and uh, discussions that are going on, as you all know, uh, we're very aware that digital media are, are disrupting our industries in, in both positive and negative ways. And there's a lot of interest in uh, innovation leading to new forms of employment, but in ways that uh, maybe don't disrupt us socially quite as much. Um, there are corporate interests, obviously, in the whole uh, area of design, design thinking, emerging media. And the authors and audience uh, in this series of publications are very important actors in, in this current movement. Um, there's a lot of discussion also in the, in the creativity theory uh, research area on, as I said, design thinking and the training of, of T-shaped individuals. What we've seen in the last five to 10 years is the emergence of PhDs in art and design and very new, a lot of new programs in, in schools of digital media. And so there's a growing cohort of professionals that are being trained at the PhD level. Uh, in Europe, some of this has been driven by the so-called Bologna process, which is bringing schools of art design into university environments. So uh, the Leonardo publications actually started in Paris in 1966-67. And over the last 10 years, um, we've been seeing a very large growth in audience, uh, but also in submissions of articles and books, proposals, and uh, other proposals, as you, as you will hear. Um, this also means there's a growing number of university programs and tenure track faculty internationally. Uh, and so uh, the fact that Leonardo is a tier one, rank A, uh, scholarly peer reviewed journal has made it very attractive uh, to, to young professionals. And so uh, Teca is intended to be a publishing and service platform for this community. As I said, uh, the Leonardo publication was founded in, 19, uh, in, in Paris in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the first computer art become, that started to appear in the, in the 1960s, of course, and Leonardo became a premier place uh, for those people to document that. Now, at the time, uh, these, these developments were very marginal to the art and design world, um, and the artists were from all over the planet. Um, now, the, the artists in this, uh, these developments in the 60s found a lot of resistance, uh, both from universities and arts institutions. Um, I've got a couple of uh, the jokes here. Uh, if you can plug it in, it cannot be art. Uh, today we hear if it's a game, it cannot be art. <laughs> um, and also that artists should paint and not write, leave the writing to the art critics. And a lot of artists uh, really objected that they were marginalized in this way uh, with respect to their own creative practice. And then finally, just as in science, these artists were internationally connected and so they decided to start their own journal. Um, the first contract was signed with Perkin Press in 1966, uh, now part of Elsevier. Uh, that was one of the big uh, innovative uh, scientific publishing committee, uh, uh, publishers at the time. And the, the Leonardo was set up to uh, advocate the use of uh, science and technology and the arts. It featured writing by artists about their own works, but also by scholars and other kinds of researchers. And importantly, from the beginning, it's, it was designed as a scientific peer-reviewed publication. So unlike many arts journal where it's an editor-in-chief or, or an editorial board that select their friends and family, in this case, we go through a, a rather systematic peer review process, and I'll talk about that some more. The founding editor was my father, Frank Molina, and there was a very eminent uh, editorial board, as you'll see on this slide. When my father died in the 1980s, um, we then, I took it over and we moved uh, to MIT Press, and Jill uh, will explain uh, to you uh, that context. 
So the publishing program right now, as I said, we've been publishing now for 50 years. Uh, if you just do a name count of all our authors, it's about 10,000 individuals who've published either in our journals, our books, our e-books, uh, now our websites, and as you'll hear, our podcasts and, and video publications. So this is a, a large professional community. It's not gigantic, uh, but it's a growing one, and it's of particular interest uh, to companies and industries as well as uh, uh, universities. Um, on the next couple of slides, I've just listed what happened. So we were early adopters of almost every electronic technology or digital technology that you've ever heard of. Uh, from desktop publishing, uh, we had newsletters before the internet existed. Uh, we did some CDI publications, which have been lost to history. Um, and then uh, when we started working with MIT Press, we started getting a lot of pressure from our authors, particularly in this field of practice, to publish in other ways other than text. And you'll hear more on the matter of that. Now, I happened to be at, at the University of California, Berkeley at the time when the web uh, was launched. Uh, and the Leonardo website um, from the ISAS in San Francisco was one of the first 400 websites on the web. So indeed, early adopters. Um, our first scanning of our archives occurred in 1994 when Xerox asked to use the Leonardo collection as a test object for their optical character recognition software and their database uh, experiments at Xerox PARC. Uh, very rapidly with MIT Press, uh, we were able to start uh, publishing ebook versions uh, uh, that, that MIT Press has been doing systematically with, with their book program. Um, we experimented with print-on-demand, and that, we still do some of that. Um, but as I mentioned before, our authors started applying huge pressure on us to, to publish not only text and static images, but videos and podcasts uh, and all, all kinds of other media. So M MIT Press uh, created a system where we have supplementary material on our peer-reviewed articles where the authors can attach uh, multimodal or multimedia material that helps the reader understand much better what the work's about. Um, in 2014, here at UTD, we started a formal podcast platform, um, which uh, is multilingual. We have 10 languages on that podcast platform. And now, with MIT Press in the lead, uh, the Arteca platform uh, has been established as an aggregator. Um, so uh, lessons from this particular uh, way of looking at our history is the Leonardo professional community are early adopters, but not only early adopters, often they're experts. And John Ippolito, uh, who will be speaking uh, a little bit later, is an example of one of the people who's really been a pioneer in new ways, in this case, uh, in his case, of looking at the curation of new media, uh, but also other ways of interacting with, with new media. And so uh, as, a, as a scholarly uh, series of publications, we feel we have to be very responsive to the way that our community of practice is, is documenting their work. And we anticipate that this evolution will continue uh, over the, the coming decades. Um, and so um, MIT Press suggested to us that we establish a platform uh, where some of these new methods could be uh, tested out uh, and if they worked, we keep using them. If they didn't, then we'll write a, a, a report saying this was a great idea but turned out not to be a, a good one. Um, of course, as many of you know, scholarly publishing itself is undergoing a number of, of major transitions. The whole open access movement, the whole debate on the peer review system and uh, the, the fraud in scientific publications, um, and more importantly, I think, uh, from my point of view, the emergence of gray literature uh, as being a core place where professionals document what they're doing without going through a publisher. And if you look at the citations from Leonardo articles in the last 10 years, a growing percentage are URLs, and often these are not available 10 years later. And so Arteca um, is uh, providing an environment where we can do a number of things, as you'll hear. Things that are well established, such as digital libraries, that's not very risky. Uh, but at the same time, uh, people don't read the same way they used to. And so just disseminating as periodicals or in the book form that isn't responsive to the, to the reader uh, habits and needs. Um, 
It also means that we can try slightly risky things. Uh, and as you know, early adopters often crash uh, in flames. Uh, and so we provide an environment that's going to be stable where we can try new things. So just quickly to finish, um, so on open access, uh, with MIT Press, we've decided to uh, approach this as a hybrid process. Um, not all writers and not all readers uh, feel the same way about the open access community that's uh, developing. And so we have chosen to be hybrid. And so, for instance, one of our open access publications was an NSF-funded report uh, on a committee that I chaired that's available for free online at MIT Press as an open access publication. Now, in this case, the funder required this report to be published open access, and having this hybrid approach allowed us to, uh, to do that. Um, similarly, for authors, many of our authors now are beginning to come to us, or some of them, uh, and their funding agencies in Europe or in this country are requiring them to publish open access. So we have an, uh, an, an option where they can pay a page charge or a processing charge would be more accurate that their funding agency normally covers. Now, of course, for independent uh, researchers and creators, they don't have a funding agency. And so they much prefer to pub publish tr in a traditional way where the author is not asked to contribute to the publication costs. Um, and so Arteca, again, uh, we're going to be uh, experimenting with a hybrid um, a strategy of both open access and content that's behind a subscription wall uh, that subscribers have access to. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Lino journals and books are peer-reviewed. Um, MIT Press for the book series um, sends them out uh, to, to reviewers. Uh, they're actually paid a, an honorarium for peer reviewing. In the case of the journal, it's single, what's called single-blind peer review. Because we're an interdisciplinary uh, journal, we often need to, to have even four or five peer re reviewers uh, so that we get the point of view of people in different disciplines. More recently, um, the National Society uh, in San Francisco has now been started publishing videos on the, uh, their website. Those are curated uh, uh, videos. And so, for instance, J.D. Talasek, who's the cultural director at the National Academy of Science, uh, has a series of laser evenings. They record the videos, and those get uploaded. They're very high prestige videos. They're widely uh, viewed. Uh, and so they go up on the National Academy website and now also uh, on Arteca. Um, and the other thing that this platform will allow us to do will be to try different approaches to peer reviewing. Uh, and as, as you probably know, in the research community, people are trying to come up with new ways where the good stuff rises to the top and the less good stuff sinks to the bottom. And uh, John Ippolito is one of the people that's been pioneering uh, some of these approaches. Um, and so we're going to be running experiments and peer reviewing on this platform to see how we identify material that has long-lasting value. Um, the, long after YouTube has disappeared, um, these videos and, and other material will still be available. Um, and we're doing this uh, through a migration process where we test things out outside of Arteca and then migrate uh, the, the, the methodology into Arteca uh, to see how it works. Um, so I'm going to just end there with that sort of uh, rather high-level view of the motivations. Um, and let me just take the opportunity again. I think Nick Lindsay may be listening. Um, when, the, when the MIT Press came to uh, Leonardo Isast and said, gee, your audience is growing rapidly. We think it might be interesting to try an approach that we tried on a different uh, series uh, of publications in the cognitive sciences. So I'm now going to turn it over to Jill Rogers. Thanks so much, Roger. I'm really glad to have this chance to speak a bit about what we've been working on at the MIT Press and why we're excited about Arteca. So the MIT Press has a long history with publishing technologies. Our roots go back some 90 years to 1926 when the physicist Max Born visited the Institute to give a series of lectures, the transcripts of which were published and disseminated. 
We operated under a couple names and parent organizations for a few decades, but in 1962, we became an independent publishing house. Ten years later, we established our journals division with two quarterly titles that we're still publishing today. In 1995, we published our first full text interactive ebook. And in 1997, 98, we became one of the first university presses to serve our journals digitally as well as in print. In 2000, we launched MIT Cognit, which has been billed as the Brain Sciences Connection and was the first of our house built subject specific platforms to combine both book and journal content. We built mobile versions of our websites in about 2012, and in 2014, we expanded our EPUB offerings with two new products called Bits and Batches. Uh, we mentioned MIT Cognet a couple times. MIT Cognet is part of our Idea Commons family, which also includes Education Express, which is a platform focused on online learning research and digital innovation in education. And it also includes today Arteca. These products provide a customized online community space and publishing platform. And they're ideal to support interdisciplinary groups or emerging fields of research that fall outside the bounds of traditional academia. Some of the features of the Idea Commons products include user-friendly tools for easy citation, annotation, and sharing the serving of both paid and open access content simultaneously, and user support for, uh, and support for user uploaded content such as white papers, working papers, gray literature, data sets, and other archives. <clears throat> so, um, the MIT Press is the only university press in the nation whose list is based in science and technology. Though we're also widely known for our exemplary publications in art, architecture, and design. So it was a no-brainer to partner with Leonardo and the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology, an organi organization that even in its name also combines these previously discrete disciplines. As Roger mentioned, Leonardo joined our journals program in 1992, which means that we've been partnered with them for half of their 50 years. We've watched as more disciplines become interdisciplinary and as those once niche communities become major schools of thought and research. There's also a nice alignment of the general goals between the MIT Press and the Leonardo ISAS organization. We are striving to meet our researchers and contributors in the space where they work, we're striving to meet our readers where they are consuming content and understand how they consume that content. And we work to disseminate the highest quality research, the highest quality scholarly work as broadly as possible. In terms of creating a new product with the Leonardo team, we believe that both its brand and impact could support what we imagined Arteca could be. The journal is currently ranked number two in the category of visual arts by Google Scholar. It also sits in the first quartile in the category of visual and performing arts as ranked by Simago. And it has gathered well over 8,000 citations of its work. Plus, the content remains sticky for years. The most cited paper out of Leonardo was published in 1990. It's called Amplifying the Mind's Eye, Sketching and Visual Cognition. And it still receives over a dozen citations annually. It has an international body of contributors who are artists and scientists scholars, researchers, and faculty, practitioners, and professionals. The journal also has a broad and diverse readership. We're tracking over 325,000 full-text downloads each year from over 70 countries across the globe. So Leonardo, the journal, provides a strong base for Arteca, but it has inspired a product that provides so much more. Arteca is a curated collection. We have content from three different journals, so including Leonardo, Leonardo Music Journal, and Computer Music Journal. We have selections from five different book series from the MIT Press in subjects as game studies, platform studies, software studies, technologies of lived abstraction, and the shining Leonardo book series. Um, as Roger mentioned, it also includes the multilingual podcast series, Creative Disturbance, and some other audio, and the growing collection of video from the laser events, the Art Science Evening Rendezvous. And while you can find some of the content of Arteca in other locations, we compiled all the essentials into one location. 
If you have courses and research communities at your libraries working at the intersection of art, science, and technology, Arteca is the one product specialized for those groups. We've priced Arteca to provide major cost savings over the a la carte pricing. We provide tiered pricing based on the Carnegie classification system. And even the largest of doctoral research institutions would pay roughly just one-third the cost of a hand-picked collection. All of our content is DRM-free, and we're regularly adding new and archival content to the collection. We provide all of our libraries with counter-compliant usage stats, and our MARC records for our TECA were compiled by our friends and cohorts over at the MIT Library. We're really looking forward to setting you up with a free 60-day trial for your library. There's a rapid sign-up form on our website, and there are only three pieces of information that you need to provide us to get started. That's your name, your library, and your email address. If you also happen to know your IP ranges and your Carnegie classification tier, that's helpful, but not required to get your foot in the door. And our customer service team is available for user support, access queries, and we'll provide usage reports at the end of the trial period. And that's it for me until question answer time at the end, so I am going to pass it over to John. Uh, so that I am getting, you can see what's on my home computer as promised. Okay, so you guys should be seeing a screen that says beyond the repository. A picture of a crate and an equal sign and a picture of a mausoleum. Everybody got that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is John Apolito. Uh, my Twitter handle is the same as my name. Uh, and um, well, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm going to kind of push the envelope in terms of the future, uh, thanks that uh, now that um, Jill spoke about the, the past and um, Roger about the present, um, suggesting ways that, uh, that we can rethink uh, how uh, archives like Arteca can work as well as how the ordinary library can work. And in doing so, I'm going to be inspired by a couple of things. Uh, there will be a few Easter eggs, uh, including Roger and MIT Press, including this book, Recollection, Art, the Media, and Social Memory, which just came out uh, from the Leonardo series a couple of years ago. Um, as well as the digital curation program that Mark mentioned at the beginning that I direct at the University of Maine, an all online program where we teach things like how to require, digitize, represent with metadata, make available online, and preserve digital. So I came across this article a couple days ago um, from Inside Higher Ed called A Moonshot for Libraries. And I figured if anyone's looking at the future of libraries, this would be it. One of the quotes here struck me uh, a national faculty survey found faculty members look to their libraries for preserving content and serving as a starting point for research. And that seemed to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, preserving content, uh, creating uh, ways to discover new research are going to continue to be important roles of the library in the years to come. But then when I saw this other quote, and these are all uh, based on interviews with leaders of some of the most uh, important and board looking libraries, I was taking a, a little more uh, pause. Academia in general is best served when libraries are the trusted long-term repository for the scholarly record. So you can guess by the title beyond repositories that I'm not going to be too happy with this particular prognosis. I'm going to explain why. First, let's look at the tenets of centralized digital preservation. Again, preservation being one of the two key roles that uh, this article describes libraries playing in the 21st century. First off, storage. Uh, the default um, strategy by which uh, preservation seems to take place, something that's uh, equally engaged in by archives, museums, and libraries. Secondly, archival formats. Uh, we don't just want to store any proprietary random format. We want to migrate things into archival formats like PDF so that we can preserve them in the long run without worrying about obsolescence. And finally, fixity, uh, a technique, a mathematical uh, computer science technique whereby checksums ensure that files stay the same when you migrate them from one place or medium to another. Well, um, I think each of these is uh, vastly overrated as a preservation strategy. Storage works great if you're storing a book in a crate or a, uh, an oil painting. Take it out in 50 years, and it'll be more or less the same. 
take a, a piece of hardware or computer equipment or a storage medium and put it in a crate and bring that out in 50 years and what you will find will be almost completely unusable. The uh, software will become obsolete at the level of operating system and application. The disk format will be gone if there is a disk uh, format at all in the future. Uh, storage media and equipment will depend on uh, display resolution, voltage requirements, and all kinds of peripherals that will have disappeared. So putting something in a crate is basically consigning it to oblivion. Archival formats, meanwhile, um, I'm of the belief there is no archival format for digital preservation. The coin of the realm in terms of um, the typical library approach to uh, preserving uh, documents is PDF. PDF is uh, fairly stable, um, at least in the short run, but it's not a computational medium. And using PDF to uh, create, uh, um, try to represent the complex software-driven and multimedia works of the present is a very poor uh, substitute. Um, I noted recently a study um, examining the likely or the uh, the uh, benefits of saving spreadsheets at PDF, and I was horrified. I can't imagine anything worse to do to the stream of data than render them as a static uh, um, page-like uh, service without being able to analyze them and use them as data in the future. Obviously, something like comma-separated text, which is much simpler of a format than PDFA, is a much more sustainable and reusable format for the future. We can't always guarantee, though, what those formats will be. So the illusion there will be one format that will save them all, I think, is just an illusion. Fixity, meanwhile, is practical. It helps you keep track of files and see if they're the same from one migration to another. But Fixity is like a seat belt on a lifeboat. When it keeps you in the chair, which is handy, but when the Titanic goes down, you gotta get that lifeboat out of the ship and start rowing it somewhere. So I think we need a much more um, forward thinking and adaptable and variable approach to preserving culture in the digital era. I'm going to talk about some premises of distributed digital preservation. So migration and reinterpretation rather than storage. These are ways that you can imagine things uh, transferring into formats that they aren't part of now. And not only that, you have to assume that my, that transfer will be a continuous process into the long-term future. Other strategies, a source code escrow. Oftentimes, uh, it's unavoidable to deal with proprietary formats as much as we'd like to. Someone gives you a document in Microsoft Word or uh, some software format uh, game that is uh, proprietary, you can't get access to the source code. What you can do is negotiate with the originator or the publisher to put the source code in a separate account that is accessed upon a certain criteria, like that creator dying or the commercial value of that product no longer being available. That's not something that's centralized, you're actually putting it in a third party to hold for you. Finally, emulation as a service is a really promising uh, strategy whereby a computer simulates or impersonates an older operating system in order to run software that would now be obsolete on contemporary hardware. I'm gonna show you a quick screencast of uh, one of the first examples of emulation as a service uh, running in a browser. This is from the art uh, platform Rhizome. And it focuses on CD-ROMs created by the game artist Teresa Duncan in the 1990s. Now, uh, these CD-ROMs originally were packaged in a, uh, these um, uh, essentially, you know, big boxes like the old CDs used to be. You stuck them into your Mac SE or whatever computer you had, and you had to have that to run. Now, you can run this directly in a browser. As you can see, inside a web browser, it's starting the emulator that then runs the CD-ROM. You get the old Mac SE startup screen. Um, you may notice that the uh, cursor separates. That's because there is a slight lag between what's happening on your computer and what's happening on a distant emulator. But now I can see the, um, the CD-ROM itself, hear the sound, interact with it, play with it. Um, and uh, for all intents and purposes, I'm having an experience very similar to what I did in 1990 when I actually loaded the original CD-ROM. One difference, though, I don't have the CD-ROM on my computer. It's being accessed through a browser. Not only that, I have the choice to run the emulator, which in this case, I can choose United States, European Union, Asia East, whichever one's close to me. That's actually different than the emulator, uh, uh, the sort of site, Rhizome, that's an allowing me to access the content. So my experience running a browser is in my location, maybe in my underwear in my basement. Rhizome is hosting the emulator 
but they don't actually have the emulator as a service, that turns out to be in one of the locations I choose. For example, it could be the European Union in Germany. And the disk image for the CD-ROM is in a completely different place. This model, this sort of um, example of uh, a distributed approach, in this case, emulation of a service, I think tells us what the future is going to be. We can't be experts in maintaining and preserving every single format. What we can do, though, is link the experts into a network that enables us the convenience of viewing outdated material in the browser in our own home. Let's look at another, the other side that I spoke about, which is research discovery. Again, the centralized model. Institutional repository. Everybody's pushing for that now. Let's get every library, every academic institution, every university to have its own repository. Inside our metadata standards. We know we need standards to be able to talk to each other, to be able to find things, and you have to apply the same standard to have it work across systems. And finally, OAS harvesting. OAS is the model uh, open access um, um, system that um, provides a model for connecting data across repositories, where periodically the uh, database would essentially publish data to the web, and then a, a federated harvester would go and find those data and stick them in a search engine so everyone could find things, whether they're the MIT library or the University of Maine library. Um, sadly, I think this is not a great model. Um, institutional repositories have become silos that are not generally uh, uh, viewable outside of the university that you belong to, and that's the case of a number of proprietary uh, uh, commercial models as well. In, in addition, um, you know, standards are a great thing, but what happens when everybody has a different standard? Uh, this, uh, the, the, the Wabanaki Center at the University of Maine handles uh, 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 indigenous culture, and they're going to have a different set of standards necessarily than that of the Library of Congress or the Museum of Modern Art. Um, here's a wonderful um, cartoon by the artist XKCD that explains why we have so many competing standards and why the idea of adding another standard to capture them all will only exacerbate the problem. Finally, uh, the idea of an OES harvester is a great idea, it's just that no one has built one. It's a very time-intensive process, and there are very few examples, I think I can count them on one hand, where this has been successful. So what to do? Well, again, I think the answer is to distribute the process of research discovery. We can have cross-institution uh, information, or as, um, as Roger alluded to, gray literature that goes outside of institutions. Someone's blog, uh, someone's personal website, an archive uh, that, that uh, is maintained on, uh, by a community as opposed to, say, a university or a, a major uh, library or archive. Secondly, we can crowdsource metadata. We don't have to have all the metadata link up in a single standard. We can just have loose coupling between standards that enable us to find each other, even if we speak different languages. Finally, um, you can have examples where people create publishing platforms based on these premises, and I'm going to show an example that uses the platform Scalar and ThoughtMesh. These are two different publishing platforms, both based on distributed research discovery, but a recent project funded by the Toma Foundation has offered us a chance to see how they could link up. Essentially, instead of creating a publishing platform, we're creating publishing APIs. An API just being a set of hooks that allows you to access a system without necessarily installing it on your server or on your, um, on your hard drive. So um, let's look at an example of this, um, this last uh, uh, one in action. Here is a scalar page. Some of you may have heard of this system, originally produced out of uh, USC, that allows for scholarly publishing with a multimedia uh, uh, sort of format that is very convenient. One of the nice things I like about scalar is that it brings, uh, if, you, if you add a, uh, say, a video or an image from an existing archive, you don't actually have to carry over the video. It links to the original source. But it does carry over the metadata for you. So thanks to the magic of RDF, captions, uh, citations, and so forth will automatically appear in your article. You don't have to write them. But there's another feature that was just added to, uh, to Scalar recently. And if I jump to the bottom of this article, I'll see it. Um, there is a section called ThoughtMesh. And ThoughtMesh allows you to uh, see articles that are there, but um, are not in the same site as the current website. Uh, so uh, it's based on tags. 
in this case the tags associated with articles art, performance, and media, but it is not a, uh, an article, uh, I should say it's, it's not tags that only pertain to this website the way that, say, tags on a WordPress site do. They go out and they find other articles that are related to the same topics on the web. So let's look at one of them. Oh, gosh, look, this guy, Roger Molina, is the top-rated uh, related article to this one with three tags. Believe it or not, that is actually a coincidence. Um, I'll click on one of the keywords that's associated with him, and now I see a section, uh, sort of an, an, a, a box that opens up in Scalar showing all of these other articles, and not just that, drilling down into in specific excerpts of the articles related to that topic. So if I go to Roger's article, I can click on that. All right, so now I'm seeing an article on the conservation and restoration of new media art that Roger wrote. Um, and if I look at the time tag cloud for this, I can see uh, that has uh, some of the same tags that the Scalar article did. This is not Scalar, though. It's on a completely different website uh, managed by a completely different publisher. If I click on excerpts out, I can see that many of the tags in this article also have other uh, articles associated with them. I can pick something like, um, say, I don't know, preservation and media, um, combining articles together, and then I can see the excerpts out that result from those and follow those as well. So uh, what this does is give me the chance to um, view, the, um, view the variety of research possibilities across the web, not just in scholarly publications and repositories, but in the great literature that, uh, that Roger described. So um, that gives you an example of Thought Mesh in action. And I wanted to end with just one last uh, screen. Thought Mesh does have a peer review uh, um, kind of uh, engine built into it, and it does follow a slightly different model um, than the kind of classical peer review. So I thought I'd show a picture of that. This is an example of peer review from the uh, from Thought Mesh from a particular article, and um, the differences are primarily that everything is open. The author can respond directly to the process of the reviewers uh, commenting on the works. And uh, that creates more of a dialogue than sort of one-way conversation. Uh, and one of the things I think is most exciting about this was that the, the two collaborators on Thought Mesh, uh, John Bell and Craig Dietrich, uh, John had the idea that most uh, uh, academics are, uh, have a good reason for being stuck in their disciplines. They, they are uh, in danger uh, of being insecure when they step outside of the field that they have got tenure in and try to, to work uh, in another discipline? What if someone says, oh, you know, you're naive or you, 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 know, you haven't studied the literature or how can you not know theory X? So if we really want to break down walls between departments and have true interdisciplinary collaboration and connect poets and anthropologists and new media scholars, then we need to do better. This uh, peer review uh, dynamic has a really interesting feature, which is that you have the ability to rate how much expertise you claim about the current article. If you claim a lot, as in the icons you can see at left of an academic wearing a mortar board in a typical graduation um, doctorate um, outfit, then um, your, uh, your review will be rated more strongly by those who agree or disagree with it. Meaning that, let's say that you take a stance that the rest of the academic community violently disagrees with, that's gonna take a hit to your karma. If, on the other hand, you choose a much lower level of rating, uh, which goes down to just sort of normal person or the complete Yahoo, which is just a propeller hat, I have no idea, I've never studied anthropology before, but I think this topic is fascinating and I'm really interested in X. Then if someone disagrees with you on the peer review kind of board, um, it won't have any hit to your credibility in the system, and that uh, encourages academics to step out of their comfort zone and go ahead and uh, dip the waters in another field. So I hope I've shown you some uh, examples of what I think the future is and why it is, lies more in distributed culture than in centralized repository. And now I believe I'm going to hand things over to Cassini. Thanks, John. <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking in detail <clears throat> about Arteca, the art science technology aggregator. And to recap some of what's been said, um, 
Our tech has been modeled after Cognet. It's been built on the same digital platform that Cognet was built on and has been expanded um, to include multimedia and multilingual content uh, as well. Uh, particularly, the product is for researchers, scholars, artists, students, practitioners in uh, the domains mentioned uh, that Leonardo and the MIT Press engage in. One of the strategies has been to look at and include hybrid, hybridized open access and subscription-based access to uh, the content that's inside our TECA. And as has been mentioned before, and I'll, I'll delve into this a little bit more, one of the key things that we're trying to do is to capture and stabilize that gray literature, the content that's that may be difficult to find that uh, at later dates and has no digital object identifier. Um, and then finally, one of the points uh, that, that Roger mentioned earlier is that we are proposing uh, to create our tech as a community so that people who contribute to the content, to the quality, or to the pertinence of the corpus of our tech will get free access uh, and be sort of a group of experts for curating. Some of the other features of Arteca are that we are engaging, our, our goal is to engage a large variety of publishing formats and various different types of content, uh, as well as various ways to enter that content. The targets uh, of Arteca are obviously librarians like you. Uh, in many cases, that schools, at schools of art and design, but that, uh, that don't have necessarily a large budget, um, as well as uh, other interested parties. And to speak to where our tech has come, uh, come from and to where it's going, uh, one of uh, the things that Jill mentioned is that the product was launched in 2016. We opened with nearly 200 books, 200 journal issues um, from about 4,000 people. Uh, and we are currently in phase two, which, in which the MIT Press team continues the production aspects of the project, adding in books and journals. While here in Dallas, our team adds tools for the production team and new functionalities for users and uh, while continuously improving the user experience. Um, the culmination of phase two would allow for fast addition of content and automation of these core production tasks, not just for MIT teams, but for um, users engaged in the content uh, uh, as well. And the goal there is that the, the tools will allow that to scale. In phase three uh, of this project, we would look to create ecologies by making our tech into a system of systems. In some of the ways that John has mentioned already, this would allow both the MIT team and the Arteca community of authors and contributors to add content, particularly the gray literature. Um, more to the point, we would open up an API and application programming interface, allowing the community to contribute complementary tools and systems on top of the platform uh, and alongside the, the dev teams at UT Dallas and at MIT. Um, so I'm speaking to an audience that is well aware and knows gray literature probably better than I do. Uh, gray literature, <clears throat> uh, the, the points to be made here are that gray literature um, are becoming increasingly important in scholarly communication despite its lack of review. and uh, as Arteca is um, poised to do, is it, it will capture, dis discover, and curate, and stabilize that content inside its holdings. So to take a closer look at this, we are, um, as Roger mentioned earlier, engaged in capturing podcast content, both from the MIT Press and Creative Disturbance, and working with others to capture their podcasts. We just recently added video content to our holdings as well, and that'll be expanding over the summer. In the near future, we hope to add catalog materials as well as other types of gray literature objects um, into its holdings. But our challenge as development teams is to define the content types in some of the ways that John mentioned in ways that are flexible but, but uh, firm enough to hold, then finding ways to aggregate that. We're attaching DOIs to all of the gray literature objects so that they are stable and citable um, and won't get lost to, to data in link rot. So the ultimate goal is that they'll be accessible uh, on, on any range of years. Specifically, looking at Arteca, um, 
and beginning this summer, you'll have access to the entire corpus of Leonardo, uh, LMJ and L uh, CMJ. LMJ is the Leonardo Music Journal, CMJ is the Computer Music Journal, and all of the supplementary materials associated with those journals. Comparing those three journals to Project Muse, JSTOR, and EBSCOhost, Project Muse, uh, starting this year, just uh, featured similar holdings to what we have, full um, access to Leonardo and, and the other journals. Uh, by contrast, JSTOR, you'd have to purchase two different packages in order to, to match our tech as holdings. And EBSCO host, uh, a quick search on Ulrich's web tells us that EBSCO host varies by which package you purchase, but none of them have all of the complete holdings of any of these journals in, in their packages. Um, taking a turn here to books, uh, Arteca has near, nearly 200 titles in its holdings. We've been adding since we've launched. Project Muse uh, has 360 titles from the MIT Press, but as you know, this access is sort of by basis, uh, book by book, and so UT Dallas, the institution that Roger and I are at, only has 17 of those 360 titles. JSTOR is very similar, and I think UT Dallas has something like 20 titles out of JSTOR's holdings, and EBSCO hosts as well. It varies by institution. So Arteca's holdings, uh, like Cognet's, will continue to grow. I think when Cognet launched, it had something like 200 books. Today, 17 years later, it has uh, about 700 books in its holdings. And then finally, as we've been mentioning all throughout, we are adding and growing the gray literature and um, expect that to, to continue. Uh, one last point before we move on here. The, in looking at the analytics statistic, statistics for both Cognet and Arteca in, in the past two years uh, for Cognet and in the past year for Arteca, um, about 80% of the downloaded materials has been books. 20% uh, of that materials has been journals. Arteca has had similar patterns, uh, and you would be able to access the specifics with your with your counter reports. Roger, anything to add here? No, I think I think that's fine. Um, I, I guess just for the audience listening to all of this, it, it might sound a little bit frightening. Um, and as uh, Cassini explained, we're doing this in this phased approach. Uh, where things that are easy to, d to do t today, like digital libraries uh, we're doing, those are clearly stable, and some of these other things, we will capture the content, but we'll, we'll be able to migrate to new kinds of systems in the future. Thanks, Roger. And then the, the last point here to be made is that we are, as, as uh, you can see, continuously developing and improving this process. Um, through user research, ongoing uh, and specific usability tests, as well as trying to understand the, the immense amount of analytics that's coming through uh, through Google Analytics using their HART framework, if you're familiar with that. And um, additionally, developing the platform not just for libraries, but also for individual users, allowing users to bookmark and save that content specifically for faculty or instructors they could create reading lists as a result of that and, and send that link out to students at their institution. We're also actively explore, exploring how to integrate into learning management systems such as Blackboard, um, et cetera, and uh, we're very early in that project process, but we, we expect that to continue. So to summarize what Jill mentioned earlier, it's very easy to sign up and, and explore what we have. Um, you just It requires three bits of information and you can log in at that link. Um, we, uh, as, as part of the development team, we are very open to hearing what you would like to, to have or, um, or tools and features and functionalities that are of benefit or, or that you would like to see within the Arteca system. So I am going to turn it over to Mark, um, who I think will be taking your questions. Thank you, Cassini. Um, this is Mark Dirks from ACRL in Choice, and um, I thanks very much for passing the ball back. Um, I would encourage you, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop those into the chat panel. Um, we should all be able to see them there. Um, and we've got, I think, a question or two in the chat box already. So, um, and it looks like the one that we've got there 
first up is from Antoinette. And Antoinette is, is asking, can Arteca be integrated with older LMSs, um, such as, uh, I think she said Voyager initially, but has changed that to Moodle. Do you know, Jill or Cassini, um, what sort of LMS integrations are available for Arteca? I think that would depend on the um, universities and institutions that we're supporting, but we would actively work with those institutions to, to support that. Um, we're in the very early phases of that and would, would love to hear from you which, which ones are uh, most valuable to, to the community. Great, great. And I think we're looking for a few more questions. Um, so if you do have anything that you're uh, just burning to ask either John or Roger or Cassini or Jill, uh, feel free to drop that in the box. And we'll, we'll deal, we'll uh, handle the question there. I'll give you just a second to do that here at the end of the hour. All right. Um, um, Mark? Yeah. You... Mark? Yes. Yeah, I, I see David Rose put up the wall folks on me. Maybe yeah. I can. Uh, both Cassini and, and John to talk to the issue of how in this very, you know, that the language is evolving so rapidly in our community. How do you structure material? John, are you there? Uh, I am. I'm just get, noticing that in the um, one of the chat windows, um, one of the um, attenders says he can't hear. So I'm just wanted to make sure that um, the attenders can hear us. I believe they should be able to, yes. Okay. All right, so uh, the question was about folksonomy. Um, uh, I'm, do you want me to start, uh, Roger, and then yeah. right talk about that? Sure, so when I mentioned crowdsourcing metadata, that's an example of folksonomy. Folksonomy is, of course, as the, uh, ask, uh, the questioner probably knows, um, allowing a community to determine the uh, the descriptive terms particularly, uh, but sometimes all kinds of metadata associated with particular projects. I think it's an extremely powerful uh, technique. Um, it can be dangerous if you expect too much of your um, of your metadata, but having worked in institutions where people often got um, uh, things wrong who were official registrars adding, you know, information into a single field that was unquestioned as though it was a word from God, I know that metadata is something we should always uh, suspect. What's wonderful about uh, folksonomies is that they allow us to capture uh, the sort of snapshot of what the public at any given time thinks about a, a topic and how they relate to it. There are a number of quite interesting studies uh, about folksonomies and their success and failures. And um, one of the common conclusions to all of them that I can think of is that they tend to engage your audience. So regardless of whether they make the ultimate results more findable or they produce more accurate results, which they do certainly in many cases, they always engage the public and that's something that I think libraries and other institutions will need to do more of, uh, especially when um, there are so many other social media competing for their attention in the 21st century. Yeah, and I, I agree with uh, what John's saying uh, about folksonomy. I think that's something that we have actively been discussing here in the development teams, that we are looking at this from a discipline-based uh, perspective to help people understand our tech as holdings, but a folksonomy that a user could, could attach to the objects, in, in many cases, could be much more valuable, particularly if users are, are using this content for their classes uh, and to, to help them understand the richness of the content. Um, so it's something that we are actively exploring here at, at, at UT Dallas. Uh, one, one note bef before I toss it back over to, to Mark, um, I believe somebody asked about how does Arteca propose to do cataloging. I, I do want to make the note that, that's, um, that we are, are um, looking at adding catalog materials uh, to the, the holdings of Arteca. In particular, exhibition catalogs. Exhibition catalogs, yes. So it's not the more general uh, task of cataloging. Great, thank you. Thank you for the responses to that. Um, if if we have any other questions, um, I'm not sure that I see them right now, um, but if there are other questions in the audience, please feel free to, to drop them in. 
Um, I see we have uh, a comment here from Christine that says, uh, all right, but reliance on MARC records is problematic as a question. Uh, is, do you see reliance on MARC records as being a problem for cataloging or for um, maintaining, uh, maintaining holdings and, and that sort of thing? I can speak to that from to, to John. I think is that. Okay. I, I'm I'm happy to speak to it from my perspective. Um, you know, my my specialty is sort of complex uh, media and soft driven works or works that have uh, performative uh, character, and um, those are not uh, easily captured by uh, systems that were designed to to originally work with books and and other uh, sort of document driven formats. So I think what we're finding is at least what I'm finding as a as a curator. Uh, and scholar of 21st century culture is increasingly um, the 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 artifacts and the processes that are culturally relevant are wrapped up in levels of software, and that means that um, they are beholden to the same kind of dynamic that software has. Software comes out in versions. You probably downloaded a new version of your operating system or phone or uh, application X um, in the last uh, you know week uh, and. Um, works of art and culture are no different. Um, when a work is um, is created um, in new media, it has to constantly be changing in order to survive and not become ephemeral and obsolete. And that means we need a way to track uh, versions of projects, um, in some cases a different uh, versions of the same work collected by different institutions. The complexities inherent in that I have not found represented in a single uh, um, uh, metadata standard, although some have come pretty close. So I would just argue that um, we need a really uh, a big tent in order to accommodate all the different kinds of standard uh, metadata that we want to capture when we look at digital culture. And to, uh, I'd like to add to that that the, the MARC records are um, standards for, as you, as the librarians well know, for for them to add the, the holdings into their catalogs, um, and the, the shift into an API would allow other individuals to um, add, to, to engage with that content. Um, but what we'll, our hope is that we are, we're building uh, our tech in a way that's nimble and able to, to change and be flexible to, uh, to, to the um, to, to techno technological changes as well. Yeah, and j just to, to, to uh, follow on on that question on, on the, the MAC records, um, there's another question here uh, pointing to the, uh, I think it was the base uh, search uh, database. So uh, w one of the ideas indeed is to provide an environment where as, as search technologies uh, develop over the coming decades, we can actually uh, have multiple search uh, uh, technologies on, on our TECA. Um, some of which will depend on the, the, the user type, um, depending on what you're doing. If you're looking for, if you're researching for a lawsuit, uh, you may have a, a different need than if you're a visual artist trying to find prior work and so on. So uh, the, the idea would be uh, to, to actually have, uh, as time goes by, multiple search engines. Uh, right now we've just got a basic uh, search engine uh, going. But the, the idea is indeed uh, to, to allow different entry ways uh, into the, the material, um, which also then uh, gets into the whole issue of how uh, we link the Arteca content with material outside uh, of Arteca in, in a way that preferentially um, draws on other holdings that are relevant to, to that particular search. Great, thank you for for expanding on that, Roger, and for addressing the, the question on base as well. Uh, yeah, so um, the answer on base is yes, it's on our list. Um, but, it, but indeed, um, my, you know, our, our feeling is that we, we, we will work with the research community trying out a variety of, uh, of search engine strategies. Great, and I see we've got, um, take maybe one last question here um, from Christine. Um, and Christine mentions that uh, she's glad that you're saying something about the searching process within Arteca um, and that reliance on Boolean-based logic is, is limiting. 
Uh, how do you see semantic search coming into play either now or in the future for Arteco or sort of more generally? Okay, so that, that, that you know, that, I guess my previous answer sort of addressed a little bit of that. All that. All right. Um, but again, research communities, for instance, are much more sophisticated in their use of search uh, technologies. Uh, so, you know, some of the problem then is having search approaches that maybe the general student population uh, would, would be able to use, but then also uh, ha having other search technologies, which, as you point out, don't rely on Boolean logic, but more on, on uh, semantic uh, approaches, um, w of which um, there, are, there are a few uh, search engines in that territory. Um, but our feeling is that at this point, that's a good example of what we want to do on Arteca, uh, providing an environment where different search technologies can be used and approached, and in fact, then people can compare what they get from a variety of, of search methodologies. Great. And I would just add to that that uh, we see uh, artificial intelligence playing a bigger and bigger role in lives, whether it has to do with self-driving cars or choices made by algorithms in our Facebook feed. Um, so there are many uh, technologies that exist out there to augment the search well beyond Boolean. The thought mesh and scalar ones use two such technologies, RDF and, um, and lexical frequency, which simply amounts to uh, when you put in an essay, it counts the number of words and sees which words you use most often. And then it tries to connect you to other essays based on those frequently used words. So the, the, the algorithm doesn't have to be complicated to be a lot better than the crappy Boolean search engines that most library catalogs now give us. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Roger and John and, and Jill and Cassini. Thanks to everybody who's listening in. Um, this is Mark from ACRL and Choice. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us today and for sharing all of this information about Arteca and um, the, the various other platforms that you've, you've mentioned, uh, Scalar and whatnot. Uh, I would just remind everybody that's still on the call that we did record today's program. Um, so please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to that recording. Uh, thank you, everybody out there listening in today. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope that the rest of your day is great. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.